All right, let's get started. So happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another ASTSR students webinar. This time we're hearing from Max Fagan. He is an aerospace engineer and pilot with a background in trajectory optimization and space-based resources. He completed his undergrad in astrophysics and electromechanical engineering at Vassar and Dartmouth College and his graduate work in aeronautics and astronautics at Purdue University with a focus on Mars entry, descent, and landing. Since then, he has worked at NASA Ames, SpaceX, and Made in Space. He currently lives in Seattle, working as a piloting engineer on the development of NASA's Artemis V lander. His parrot's name is Beetlejuice. Thank you for joining us today, Max. We're so excited to hear you speak about practical models for our solar system's future and developments in space innovation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Max, uh, coming to you from this uh, nondescript government conference room at the Johnson Space Center. Um, I, cur I currently live in Seattle, but uh, on work trip on work travel right now. So I'm excited that we're still able to make this happen. Can uh, just oh sorry, can someone just confirm that um, I am coming through video and audio wise? Yep, all good. All right, excellent. Um, so today we're going to be talking about a very a very far out topic, but I'm going to do my hardest to try to keep things grounded reality, grounded in practical reality and some hard numbers. Um, I am an aerospace engineer, as Anna said. I am far more comfortable in the domain of hard numbers and hard physics, um, and I am gradually getting more and more comfortable in the realms of far out speculation. Um, but I do still try to, to try to work very hard to keep uh, our far off speculation as grounded as possible in practical reality, and that's what we're going to be working on doing today. Um, just a quick background on um, on my journey so far, as Anna said, uh, I started at Vassar College in um, upstate New York as an astrophysicist. I went to Dartmouth to get my uh, uh, bachelor's in engineering, electromechanical engineering, where I worked on uh, high altitude balloons uh, for uh, studying dark energy. Um, I spent some time at NASA Ames. This was my first NASA internship, and uh, I absolutely fell in love with NASA and, um, and uh, the work that we do here. Um, I went to Purdue to finish my graduate work in aeronautical and astronautical engineering. This is where I worked uh, as on Mars entry, descent, and landing, but it's also where I kind of got my first taste of uh, in situ resource utilization um, and started to understand the, uh, the various ways that humanity can inhabit the future solar system. Uh, did a rotation at SpaceX, working as mass properties engineer on Crew Dragon. Uh, did a couple of rotations at the Mars Desert Research Station with some of my, uh, some of my Purdue colleagues. Um, spent five years at Maiden Space working on in-space additive manufacturing and assembly, uh, ISMA, uh, the uh, 3D printer that's currently on the International Space Station. That was uh, something I did a little bit of work on. Um, and for the last four, four years, uh, I've been at Blue Origin working on the Orbital Reef Space Station and now on the Artemis V lander. Um, though it's, I do want to emphasize that I am speaking entirely for myself and on my own behalf. Nothing that I am saying here represents the opinions of uh, any of my employers, uh, current or past. So the questions that I want us to ponder today are, uh, are as follows. Um, we all know what the solar system looks like now, and I think we're pretty good at speculating on what our progress in the solar system is gonna be in the next couple of years. But I want us to start thinking about what are the next few centuries in the solar system going to look like? Where are people going to live? Uh, where, will, where will our resources come from? What are we going to be doing in space? Because hum humans aren't going to be in space unless we have something that we actually need to do there. And of relevance most to, uh, to this group, um, what role is artificial gravity going to play? Uh, where is it needed? How much is it needed? How long is it needed? And what are the different, um, what are the different locations that actually require it and to what extent? Uh, as a couple of ground rules, because multi-century speculation uh, does have a tendency to get um, kind of ungrounded unless we force ourselves to abide by some ground rules, um, we're going to assume that humans are still going to need the same stuff, um, we're gonna, and, and in roughly the same proportions. We need air, we need water, we need food, we need volume, we need a mild temperature and radiation environment, uh, and we need space to, do, space to engage in human activities with other people. Um, and it's going to be the same thing with the industries that support us. They're still going to need roughly the same stuff in the same proportions. So let's assume none of that is going to change. Um, no new physics, 
Um, I, uh, I, 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 I'm not going to say that we have finished physics or uncovered all the physics that there is to uncover, but I, we are going to assume that the laws of physics as we currently understand them are, uh, aren't going to change. No faster than light travel. Um, we'll definitely be able to do the processes that we currently engage in more efficiently, but we're never going to reverse entropy or get free energy or something like that. Um, in speculating what the uh, what the future solar system is going to look like, I'm going to have to assume that basic economics isn't going to change. Um, we're still, no matter what system we live under, we're still going to always be incentivized to do things with higher efficiency, although we might change how we choose to measure that efficiency. So we might start talking in terms of delta V or uh, specific mass or something like that, but we're always going to be incentivized to do things as efficiently as the, as, as the local environment will permit. Uh, I'm going to assume no miraculous robots. Uh, obviously, living through the last two years have been an exciting time to be an AI engineer or living uh, living in a world of autonomy. Um, but I'm going to assume that the uh, that the impact is going to be the same as it was before of all automation. It's going to make humans more capable, but it's not going to supplant the need for humans to be present where the work is actually being done. Uh, and unfortunately, no aliens. We're going to have to assume that there's no aliens. It's uh, it's just us. I'm not, again, I'm not going to say that all of these are good assumptions. Um, I'm just going to assume that they're necessary assumptions to keep this kind of far out speculation of what the future solar system is going to look like grounded, practical, and in a realm of feasibility. Uh, if you want to concoct a future solar system that uh, challenges one of these rules, be my guest. You're, uh, you're welcome to speculate on whatever futures you would like. But these are going to be the ground rules for this presentation. So the central assumptions that are kind of going to drive this, um, this speculation is kind of governed by two things. Um, these are these are rules that I think hold pretty well for how and where humans have lived on Earth. And I don't haven't yet uncovered a reason to think that things will be any different in space. Where we inhabit in space is going to be governed by the two questions of access and need. Humans live in a place where we have access to. How hard and expensive is it to get to? How hard and expensive is it to get back from if we're talking in terms of trade? Um, and humans don't live somewhere unless we have an actual need to live there. There's some work to be done there. There are resources there. There's an, a, a pleasant environment there that wasn't available in the previous location. Um, the call to adventure and the need to explore are absolutely one of the needs that it, are absolutely one of the needs that drives people from one place to another. But there's all sorts of reasons why humans would move from one location to another. But it never, it never happens until that need is identified. Is what I'm going to argue, and I'd argue that 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 remains as true in space and throughout the solar system as it does here on Earth. Ah, here we go. Sorry, my slides are, there we go. So the way to frame this, um, I, 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 I've tried a couple of different ways in order to, uh, to frame this conversation, but the framing that I have found most useful, I'm indebted to Bruce Grierson Rick, and Rick Tumlinson and a couple of others for kind of setting up the framing on the future solar system in this format. Um, and it's the framing of kind of the four philosophies. Um, so these four philosophies are four kind of meta narratives about what the future of the solar system is supposed to look like, what it will look like, what humans will do, where we will go, um, and the role artificial gravity will play, which is kind of embodied by four different people. That's Werner von Braun, uh, Gerard O'Neill, uh, Robert Zubrin, and Carl Sagan. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the works of any of them, these are kind of the two books that I would recommend as kind of most representative of their, of their perspective and their arguments for what the future solar system looks like. We'll dive a little bit into the details of each one of these. But I also really want to emphasize these are these are not Hogwarts houses. You are allowed to, to ascribe to multiple versions of these philosophies. All Many of the ideas I'm gonna be talking about in this talk can be equally well ascribed to all four of these philosophies. You don't have to say that you are only one of these. Uh, I am hashtag team space. I, I believe there it is a big solar system and there is a, and there is room for a lot of different mindsets into what the future solar system looks like. Um, so please take nothing that I am saying in this talk as, um, indicative that you have to pick one of these or one of these is better than one of the others. They're all just different ways of looking at the future solar system and they have their various merits and, uh, and, and cons. So let's talk about the von Braunians first as Werner von Braun, kind of embodied by Werner von Braun and Kraft Erike, kind of the post-World War II mentality on what the expansion into space was supposed to look like. Um, the idea is the idea does tend to still find its rep, find its adherence um, in the halls of federal power um, at, on, on the nation state level, um, but it is it is a little bit harder to find um, 
places in industry or places in academia where this um, where this mindset is still kind of the governing philosophy. And the vision, the overall vision as as um, as embodied by this one is the idea that space is space is the domain of great powers. Space is where nation states extend the extend the geopolitics of Earth. The reason that we are in space is because nation states need to be in space in order to control the high ground. If you've ever heard heard anyone talk about space as the new high ground, they're probably talking from the perspective of a von Braunian. Um, there is lots of science and industry to be done in space, but it's not the raison d'etre. It's not why we're in space. We're in space because um, it is because space is just like Earth and it is an extension of national politics. Um, their perspective on artificial gravity was that it was a nice to have, but it wasn't really a requirement. There were all sorts of um, plans for how to use space in the von Braunian philosophy. Um, many of them were large orbiting toroidal space stations. Um, but the appeal of artificial gravity was more that it allowed more people to live in space for longer. It wasn't really seen as um, the scientific question to be answered. It was just a nice to have. Now, granted, a lot of the von Braunian philosophy came together before we really understood the biomedical science behind artificial gravity and the uh, and the and the dangers of microgravity. So it's possible if we brought one of these folks uh, into the 21st century and updated them on the last 30 years of uh, partial G and microgravity research, they would feel differently. Um, but that's kind of the overall perspective of the von Braunians. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is the one embodied by Gerard O'Neill. Um, now, this has a context that's very uh, more 1970s and 1980s, and you still find its adherence um, in the realms of, say, the National Space Society. Um, so Gerard O'Neill uh, and his cohort, their, this philosophy was really created as a response to the environmental and overpopulation concerns of the 1960s and 70s. Now, the 60s and 70s was an era of increasing awareness of environmental issues and the environmental dangers that um, were that that, uh, that Earth is under. Um, but O'Neill O'Neill saw that saw most of these conversations as missing a really key uh, a really key point, which was that Earth is not the only environment that humanity can inhabit. In fact, it's not even really the best environment for humanity to inhabit. Um, so Gerard O'Neill was a uh, was a physicist at Princeton, um, and he wrote he and his cohort wrote a series of papers and very popular books that really popularized the idea to a wider public, where the idea was that planets are a great place to start a civilization, but they're not the best long term location for a civilization to exist. Um, if you've ever heard, uh, if you've ever heard someone use the term planetary chauvinist, uh, they're probably talking from the perspective of an O'Neillian. Um, but his idea was that, yes, Earth is a fantastic place to live, and yes, it's got the carrying capacity for tens of billions of humans, but there's a solar system out there that has the capacity for trillions of humans, where space and volume are essentially unlimited, power is nearly free, uh, there are abundant resources on the moon and the asteroids. Um, so much so that we should really think of the Earth as the starting point for human civilization, but not the not the place where most humans will live. Um, and in this scenario, why are we in space? Well, it's because we're trying to maximize the carrying capacity of the solar system and minimize the burden on Earth's ecosystem. We wanted to preserve the Earth for future generations as kind of a, a national park, a place that people visit to see the magnificence of humanity's origin, but not a place that is really optimized for um, for extended human habitation by an expanding technological civilization. Um, it was very much in the context of fears of overpopulation that I think the last 50 years have kind of pretty soundly refuted. Um, you know, overpopulation is not really the reason why we should be going to space. There's there's no plausible scenario where population concerns are ever, uh, are ever um, fixed by uh, emigrating to space. That's not really how it works. Um, and we're nowhere near Earth's carrying capacity in any sense. So I'd say the population concerns of um, of, of the original O'Neillians have kind of been pushed to the side. But there still is the argument that if you do want to support hundreds of billions or trillions of humans um, in a solar system, um, you do need to open the resources of space. And O'Neill's ideas still hold a lot of sway among folks who um, who kind of vision, picture the future solar system working that way. Um, it's also the philosophy that places the most heavy emphasis on the need for artificial gravity. Um, O'Neill assumed that we uh, we are optimized for the gravitational environment of Earth, and it would be, if not physiologically impossible, at least physiologically uncomfortable 
for a human civilization to live in a partial gravity environment, including the partial gravity environment of the moon or Mars. Now, this was the 1960s and 70s. Uh, we had no data on that question. O'Neill was, was me merely speculating. Um, and I can still see a lot of merit to the argument that we are comfortable in a 1G environment, but as I'm sure you're well aware, the last couple of the last couple of decades of research on the ISS has kind of shown that it doesn't need to be all the way to 1G by many metrics. It's it's certainly possible for humans to live in a partial gravity environment as long as there is enough gravity to offset to, to mitigate the deleterious effects of partial G. Where exactly is that number? Uh, and I can probably tell you better than a better than I can. Um, that's actually how, how we met. Uh, she was presenting uh, her results at the Mars Society Conference uh, on the uh, uh, musculoskeletal effects of partial gravity centrifugation on um, on the International Space Station. So I'm sure uh, uh, she's more qualified to talk about where is how much gravity is enough gravity. Um, but O'Neill's assumption was it has to be 1G, um, and which is why he didn't think that human civilization would ever really get a, would ever really take off on the moon or Mars, because he didn't think the moon or Mars was really enough G to support us. Moving on, uh, let's talk about the Zubrinites. So this is the philosophy embodied by Robert Zubrin, who is the founder of the Mars Society. Uh, naturally, it has a heavy emphasis on Mars as the uh, as the next frontier. Um, and uh, the the implications of um, of Zubrin's uh, of, of the Zubrinite philosophy has much more of a focus on the planetary environment. The idea that we evolved on a planet. Um, planets are still the best place for human for an expanding technological civilization. Um, Mars, while it is nowhere near as good of a home for a home for humanity as Earth, can be made to be as good of a hu home as uh, as Earth can. Um, it has the necessary resources, the necessary water, the necessary um, uh, volatiles trapped in its uh, trapped in its regolith that it can be liberated and turned into um, like a 700 millibar atmosphere, something like living at a really high altitude. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a really high altitude uh, city here on Earth. Um, and uh, it's just the first step in becoming a type three interplanet, type three interstellar species. Um, this philosophy is very much a response to the um, shuttle station era of bigger, slower, expensive uh, that NASA has been in for mo for at least m m most of my life. Um, Robert Zubrin, if uh, if you if you if you've ever met him or heard him talk, um, has a has thoughts has thoughts on um, on 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 NASA's perspective of the future solar system, um, and is very focused on what is the fastest way to do this, the most efficiently for the highest probability of success. He has very he has very little patience for bigger, slower, expensive, eventually, um, and he's also a huge advocate for um, for the advantages of artificial gravity, at least on the um, interplanetary transit portion. Uh, his um, his vision for um, the simplest involved uh, two habitats, or sorry, a habitat in an expanded upper stage, extended on a tether, um, spinning and generating uh, 0.38 G. So when the astronauts landed on Mars, um, the uh, they would already be preconditioned for the 0.38 G environment and wouldn't need to spend any time reconditioning from the microgravity environment. Um, but the um, the the big question in this architecture is: Can humanity live for an extended period of time for multiple generations in a 0.38 g environment? Uh, again, we have no data on human in, on, on human habitation in a 0.38 g environment. Certainly not for multiple generations. Uh, we have good um, we have good human analog data using rodent models, as Anna can tell you, um, and uh, we have okay data on humans in a hyper g environment, at least for days to, days to weeks periods. Um, but no real good data on whether humanity can live for an extended period of time at 0.3 AG. Uh, I have no reason to doubt that we can, but it's a very important scientific question. If the answer turns out to be that there are problems with living at 0.3 AG for extended periods of time, then it's going to be much, much harder for us to uh, permanently inhabit Mars and make Mars a second home for humanity. So at least on the short term, artificial gravity was a uh, was a big plus for um for the humans who were traveling between uh, Earth and Mars and Earth and the Moon in order to uh, precondition us for the environments that we were going to be living in. Uh, the last philosophy is the one of Carl Sagan, um, which is that space is a place for science. The reason that humans are in space is because there is valuable science to be done. There are important questions to be answered in space. Um, and uh, space is the best place to answer big questions like, where, how did the solar system form? How did life originate? Is there other life out there? Um, this is 
at least publicly, this is the philosophy that NASA espouses as science, space is a place for, uh, for, for NASA to do uh, amazing scientific work. Um, the Planetary Society as well is a pretty strong advocate for this. Um, it's, uh, it's always been present in some sense, you know, all the way back to the earliest days of speculative space flight. There, there's always been the vision of uh, there is great science to be done in space and, um, and it's the main reason for us to go. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of mute on the subject of whether or not artificial gravity is required. Um, Carl Sagan was aware of the concept of artificial gravity and, um, and was intrigued by the idea of massive space stations that rotate in the same way Gerard O'Neill was. Um, but with the philosophy of kind of science being first, the idea of massive human habitats was a, was kind of an afterthought, at least as I at least as I read most of Sagan's work. So let's try to put some actual hard numbers to this uh, to this question. Um, I am an astrodynamicist first and foremost. Uh, I am much more comfortable in the realm of trajectories than I am in the realm of sociology or thinking about um, human civilization. Um, so I so I see those four philosophies, and my first thought is let's talk about some delta v maps. Um, so what I've got here is a map of the solar system um, as a uh, as a delta V access map. So remember, our first question about where do humans inhabit in the solar system is going to be driven by where can humans access in the solar system. So what we have here on the left side um, is a map of the various places of origin that we would want um, either uh, resources or um, people to depart from. Whereas on the top, we have a list of destinations that we would want resources or people to travel to. Uh, and then the color coding is just indicating the magnitude of the one-way delta V transit from the origin to the destination. And I am assuming that aero, aero braking can be employed uh, wherever it can be. So for example, if you're traveling from the moon to earth, you can aero brake from translunar orbit down into low earth orbit, whereas you can't do that if you're going from earth to the moon. So this is not necessarily a symmetric map. Um, but already we can see some interesting um, some interesting regions developing here. Let me just see if I can get a laser pointer going here. Does not look like I can. Okay, so you'll just have to uh, you'll, I'll just have to talk you through the points that I'm pointing at. Um, so wherever we see kind of green islands, islands of um, islands of low delta V regions, we can think of those as kind of islands of accessibility, places where um, the locations on the map are going to find it very easy for humans and resources to move around between them. So for example, the, uh, the green region um, between the Earth-Moon origin and the Earth-Moon destination map, um, we can think of that as cislunar space. That's just indicating that the regions between you know, geostationary orbit and low lunar orbit and the surface of the moon and um, low Earth orbit, those regions are comparatively easy to get between. You know, there's there's the old saying that getting to low Earth orbit is halfway to anywhere in the solar system, and that and that's true. It takes about nine to ten kilometers per second to get off of Earth's surface and um, <clears throat> excuse me, and away to Earth's departure orbit. Um, it barely takes more than that though to go from anywhere from Earth's departure orbit to anywhere else in the solar system because getting off of Earth is by far the hardest uh, the hardest delta V. Um, so we can see kind of islands of accessibility opening up. We see another island um, kind of around Mars. Um, the various orbits around Mars, including Phobos and Deimos, kind of indicate another center of power, a place where it's going to be comparatively easy for people and resources to access. But it's not they're not the only islands. Uh, for example, the asteroids occupy their own island. It's very, very easy to move between asteroids. It takes a long time, months to years, because the asteroids are not physically located in the same location. But energetically speaking, uh, we can see they're comparatively close to each other. And then down in the bottom right, you can see Saturn naturally represents its own its own system, um, but there's also um, there's also places like, for example, the uh, the light green area between Earth and Mars. Those kind of rep that, that represents a region where it's not as easy to move between locations, but it's still a place of comparative ease of transport between Mars and Earth. So let's try to put the four philosophies that we just talked about kind of on this delta V map as a way to vision where they're kind of focusing. The von Braunians are kind of the easiest. Werner von Braun was always focused more on space for Earth. I mean, he did write the Mars Project. The idea of humans going to Mars was something that was very appealing. Um, and his, uh, and his, his intellectual successors kind of expanded it to include a broader picture of the solar system. But the primary focus was, since space is an extension of national power, and most of the great nation states and national powers are on Earth, um, the von Braunians were more focused about what could be done in the cislunar system as close to Earth as possible. 
The O'Neillians extended that a little bit because Gerard O'Neill, while his original papers weren't really focused on the resources of the asteroids because uh, we didn't we didn't really know about the resources of the asteroids when O'Neill was writing his papers uh, in, in, in the 60s and 70s. The uh, best picture we ever had of an asteroid wasn't even a resolved image. Uh, we had never resolved an asteroid as more than a single point on a detector. Um, but since then, uh, others have gone to kind of update O'Neill's work to include not just the resources of the Earth-Moon system, but also the abundant resources of the asteroids, and not just the main belt asteroids, which are kind of far out there, but also the near-Earth asteroids, the ones that, while not physically close to Earth, um, are energetically close to Earth and can provide abundant um, organics, carbon, uh, water, uh, all with the advantage of it already being in space without us needing to lift it off of the Moon. Zubrin obviously is more focused on the wider on the wider trade when you bring Mars into the picture. Um, Mars's primary advantage is that it is the most abundant source of carbon dioxide in the solar system, with the exception of Venus, and Venus is a hellhole. Um, so if we're if we're after uh, carbon for uh, making uh, making organics for farming, or if we need carbon to manufacture plastics, you know, carbon is a very useful industrial material. Um, Mars is kind of the place to get it because its atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. Um, so the availability of carbon on Mars, uh, volatiles and um, volatiles and other organic compounds on the asteroids, and uh, high technology on Earth kind of forms the trade loop that Zubrin uh, kind of pictures the solar system as being built on. It's the mutual trade between Earth, the asteroids, and Mars. And the Saganites, they don't really belong on this map very well because, again, they're not really so much focused on how do you move resources around or where do people live, more so on the scientific questions. And there's valuable science to be done everywhere in the solar system. So I don't really know where I would put them on this map. I just kind of put them everywhere. What about the availability of resources specifically? Well, I can't really put that on one chart. Uh, I've tried. This is kind of my best attempt at doing that. Um, what this represents is a kind of representation of where are the various um, raw materials. So for example, you can see at the top here, we've got aluminum oxide, valuable metallic sources. Uh, we've got methane, very valuable for making um, propellants, uh, liquid natural gas, it's basically methane. Um, water, so much of human civilization depends on where the water is, not just for drinking, but also for agriculture, uh, for splitting and manufacturing propellant. Um, and I've listed the four primary destinations, Earth, Moon, Mars, and the asteroids here, and showing which, uh, which of the resources they have and in what abundance is. Now, this is an, a vast oversimplification. Um, obviously, approximate, ask me what percentage of Earth is iron is a, uh, is a useless metric because 99% of the iron in Earth is trapped in our core and is completely inaccessible. So I've tr what I've tried to do is I've tried to kind of show a percentage average of the accessible resources on each material on each celestial body. And we can already see an interesting split. Um, O'Neill was always focused on the moon first, uh, although O'Neill was unaware of the availability of water at the South Pole. Um, he always he always seemed to think that the um, the water to make the water to make um, the O'Neillian picture work. Um, it was never really clear where that water was supposed to come from. We can lift it up from Earth, but as always, Earth is kind of the worst spot to get resources for space because our gravity well is so deep. Um, so his speculation was we would either pull it in from the asteroids um, or uh, or possibly find it on the moon. Uh, he was unaware that there, uh, there was water on the moon. It's not a lot. It's about um, one Lake Washington's worth of water trapped in permanent, permanent shadowed regions on the South Pole. Um, so it's only about 0.5% the composition of the regolith. Um, but it's something, um, and it's at least enough water to kind of start thinking about bootstrapping a civilization, especially if you use it in a closed circuit application like agriculture or, uh, or ECLIS. Uh, Mars, on the other hand, has abundant water. The entire northern polar cap is, uh, is water ice. Uh, and there's, uh, there's significant deposits of water uh, just a couple of meters under the surface, well down out of the polar latitudes. Um, it's not as wet as the Earth is. Uh, the if you uh, if you melted it all, the the, the resulting ocean, uh, if you spread it over the entire surface, would be only a few tens of meters thick. Um, but it's still the second wettest spot in the solar system after the Earth. Uh, and if if, if in, in the inner solar system, Jupiter's and Saturn's moons are wetter, but in the inner solar system, Mars is still the second wettest spot. So there's an abundant supply of water available there that the Zubernites are really focused in, and the O'Neillians now starting to focus in on the um, on what kind of resources that the asteroids offer. It's really hard to off it's really hard to make general um, general statements about the asteroids. Uh, the rule of the asteroids is there's an exception to every rule, including the rule. Um, 
But you can find abundant metals, at least in the M-type asteroids that are out in the main belt. Um, there is even organics and volatiles on some of the near-Earth asteroids. Uh, but extracting them is uh, really a question of, do we have artificial gravity or not? Um, the, uh, the difficulty of asteroid mining is not really well understood by the general public, I think. We tend to say that, well, the asteroids have a lot of metal, therefore getting the metal, is, getting the metal off of them is pretty easy. Uh, but that is the graveyard of many asteroid mining startups. Um, I can think of at least three asteroids, asteroid mining startups in Silicon Valley alone um, who started by saying, we're going to mine the materials of the asteroids and then realized, wait, that's really, really, really hard. Let's just survey asteroids and hopefully someone else can buy the data from us. Um, because all of our mining capabilities, every single mining technique that we have spent two millennia of human civilization developing assumed the availability of gravity. Um, there is a fascinating amount of work going into the simple, really simple questions like separating regolith from rocks. How do you do that in microgravity? Um, so many of the solutions uh, are just, well, let's provide a little bit of artificial gravity so we can use the validated methods that have worked for the last 2000 years. So uh, the, art, the availability of artificial gravity in the asteroids may have nothing to do with uh, human health and human comfort. It may be everything to do with uh, so many industrial processes counting on the availability of some gravity for separation and functionality. What, is the co what does the overall solar system economy look like once we have access to these resources? Well, again, it depends on who you ask, but kind of taking a compromise somewhere between O'Neill and Zuber, and it looks something like this. Um, it looks like Earth providing the kind of things that can only be provided when you have an entire planet industrial base available to work. You know, there's, there's no way to make um, semiconductors and computers on Mars. Doesn't matter if there's silicon available, making a semiconductor uh, requires the organized uh, economic effort of 10 nation states here on Earth. It's not going to be something that we're gonna be able to duplicate on Mars for a good long while. So Earth is probably going to be the provider of robotics and finished goods and the kind of things that require really high technology in order to manufacture. Um, and an advantage of that is those kind of things do not weigh a lot. So they're relatively easy to ship uh, in between destinations in space, regardless of the Delta V map. Um, but there's a lot of things that Earth, uh, there's a lot of things that um, Earth wouldn't be providing to space because they're more abundantly available in space. Um, one of those examples is silicates and oxygen. Those kind of things are abundantly available on the surface of the moon, on the asteroids, and even on Mars. So if we need those kind of things in space, um, we're more overwhelmingly likely to get them from destinations that are already in space rather than getting them from Earth. How do we access them? Well, we need artificial gravity. At least all of the processes that we currently use require artificial gravity. Um, it's an active field of research into finding ways to get to, to extract silicates uh, from, um, from surface materials in ways that don't require gravity. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, no one's found a way yet. Um, the, uh, the simplest way still does seem to be spin it and use terrestrial separation methods. Uh, Mars as a source of carbon, organics, and water, mostly because uh, it is, while it is a gravity well, it's a gravity well that's only one third as deep uh, as the Earth is, and it's already much, much closer, uh, both energetically and distance-wise, from the places where we'd expect all of those resources to be needed, especially if there's a massive asteroid mining effort going on in the main belt. Um, what do the asteroids provide? Well, the asteroids provide all the raw, all, all the raw materials, the kind of things that, um, the kind of things that are not, in, are, are not manufacturing intensive. Um, but are very, very low as, as, uh, as primary goods. The split between the O'Neillians and the Zubrins into what they focus on, we've already talked a little bit about this. Uh, the O'Neillians tend to have primarily a focus on Earth, Moon, and cislunar space, with humans primarily living in artificial gravity habitats in cislunar space. Um, where, do we man where do we get the materials to manufacture these things? From the Moon and the asteroids. Um, it's entirely impossible to envision how this works without artificial gravity. The, um, the availability of volume in space does not mean there's an availability of habitable volume in space um, unless we're providing a terrestrially-like environment, was O'Neill's philosophy, and that requires artificial gravity. The, the, uh, he's, he's the origin of the concept of O'Neill cylinders, if you're familiar with the term. Uh, how do we solve the radiation challenge? Well, we're not living on a planet, meaning um, we have another fifth, we have another half of the sky, which is unshielded by uh, by a planetary mass, and we lack an atmosphere to mild the radiation environment. So the radiation challenge for the Onelians was pretty hard. Um, his proposal his, his proposal involves just packing the uh, packing the spinning habitats with a uh, with a lot of uh, excess regolith, 
pack four or five meters of regolith between you and space, and you can make the radiation environment similar to the way it is on Earth. But that's certainly a lot of material. Um, launching that kind of stuff off the moon, even with really efficient linear uh, electric rail guns, is, uh, still, is still a time-intensive process. Um, and it doesn't answer the question of where do we get our water and where do we get our carbon? You can't, uh, you can't farm in lunar regolith. It has to have an organic component. So the kind of trillion dollar questions that we need to answer is uh, where does our water and our carbon come from in that architecture? Uh, for the Zubernites, it's a little bit different. They have easy access to, uh, to water because uh, their focus is on Mars, which has an abundant water. Um, same with carbon. Mars, as I said, is the second most abundant source of carbon in the inner solar system. So that solves that question pretty easily. But there still is the open question of uh, can humans live for an extended period of time in a 0.38 G environment? Again, I see no reason to think that we can't, but it's an open question. We, we, and we may not know until multiple generations of humans have just tried it, uh, which is a very ethically fraught question. Um, the radiation challenge is uh, comparatively easy because they're living on the surface of a planet and have an atmosphere, ab an atmosphere above them and a planet below them, which uh, does nice things for the radiation environment. Mars's radiation environment is more harsh than, um, than uh, the surface of the Earth, but it's not nearly as harsh as, say, low Earth orbit, where humans have inhabited for extended periods of time. Um, it's, uh, it's not enough. I'm not, I, I don't want to imply that the radiation in low Earth orbit is enough that we could inhabit it full time. We still couldn't, but there are at least ways to mitigate the radiation environment on the surface of Mars, for example, um, digging a vault underground or stacking just bags of regolith on the surface of your habitat, which you might want to do anyway in, uh, in order to counter the, the, uh, the positive pressure of the habitat. Um, and perhaps also one of the biggest questions for the Zubernites to answer is, can an interplanetary economy really be sustained um, if, the, uh, if the available lead times are two years? You know, we can only launch stuff between Earth and Mars every synodic period, which is about 2.17 years, um, at least until we've invented something like, a, uh, like an antimatter or a fusion drive that can just go straight line from one planet to another. But until then, um, it requires uh, basically independent branches of civilization to operate with trading times of two years. Uh, which is, uh, you know, that's that that that's even longer than um, than inter uh, than intercontinental trade uh, in the age of sail. Um, so, can uh, can civilizations operate with that kind of a lead time? I certainly don't know. Uh, I'm not a sociologist. I'm not an economist. I can't really answer that question. But it's something we need to answer before we can really say whether Zubrin's vision for the future solar system is uh, is practical. So then just to return to the uh, to the transport map is kind of the end of it. The reason that I really like this framing is it's not just that it shows the um, the overlapping uh, perspectives um, of these various philosophies and really emphasizes why these philosophies are not mutually exclusive. There's, there's a lot of overlap between them. Um, but it also just kind of shows the breadth and the depth of ideas that people have spent the last hundred years speculating about. Um, you know, we are only just now getting into the point where these, this, this century's worth of speculation um, is stopping it, it, it is no longer being philosophy and fiction and is starting to become engineering and uh, engineering and economics. Um, I, I, I just love that we get to be alive at a time where, um, where we can talk practically about the question of which makes more sense, a, uh, a five kilometer across rotating cylinder in cislunar space uh, or an endomed city on the surface of Mars. And the question isn't which of them is prettier. The question is which of them makes more economic sense. Uh, I, I freaking love that we're alive at a time in space exploration where these are the questions we get to answer. Um, I also really like how this map kind of goes, goes pretty far to explain um, a really complicated question, which is, why is Artemis the way it is? You know, Artemis is an incredibly fraught and complicated architecture that is kind of hard to explain from a first principles perspective. You know, starting from, starting from fresh, it's kind of hard to explain why Artemis is the way that it is. But on a map like this, um, I think it kind of makes sense to um, to explain a little further why it is the way it is. Artemis is focusing on the portion that all four of these philosophies agree with. You know, if we operate under the assumption that Artemis is a Artemis is struggling to be um, a program that can be immune to it, 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 it is a program that is. Uh, that has survived multiple administrations and is showing a lot of program longevity, longevity um, as well as um, commanding a massive amount of budget and um, and being uh, very popular, at least uh, at least in Congress. 
Um, and I think part of the reason, part of the way that goes to explain that is they're attacking questions that every one of these philosophies really cares about by focusing very closely on the narrowest portion of the cislunar, of, of, of cislunar transport. Um, I don't want to get too far into Artemis. That's not the conversation that I really want to have, but it's, uh, I do think putting it on this map is a useful way of kind of seeing how we are just dipping our toes into the broadest part of the seas that all five of, that all four of these philosophies uh, really cover. And Artemis is kind of just the first step towards that, as broad as it is. So thank you very much for, um, thank you very much for uh, uh, listening. If you have any further questions, I would be happy to answer them now. Thank you, Max. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, happy to see that artificial gravity made a mention in it as well, though I'm definitely biased. Um, folks, if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat or in the Q&A section. Um, we have one right now from Alan. If you'd like, you can um, also raise your hand and unmute to ask your question to Max directly. Um, Alan asks, how can we optimize resource efficiency in additive manufacturing for space-based component assembly? And as a follow-up, which locations in the solar system should we focus on to maximize these efficiencies? Really good question. Um, the one sentence answer that I would give is stop thinking about 3D printers. Um, we hear additive manufacturing and most people think 3D printing. There is so much more to additive manufacturing in space. Um, enough people are thinking about 3D printing in space that I, what, I, what I really want to see is a focus on the much more scalable industrial manu additive industrial manufacturing methods in space. Um, because the, the number of places that 3D printing in space is applicable are defined, circumscribed, and narrow. We don't 3D print space stations. We don't 3D print cities. None of those things get manufactured with, a, with an additive manufacturing method. They get manufactured with more conventional molding, casting, extrusion, all of those methods. And I think there is a broader misunderstanding that all of those methods are, uh, are really easy to do in space, and they are very much not. So if you want to talk about optimizing additive manufacturing for space, I would ask you to find the find the conventional additive terrestrial manufacturing method, you know, mold making, for example, and find out what the problems are to doing it in space on the asteroids in a microgravity environment or even on Mars. Because if we want to scale manufacturing in space, we need to scale conventional manufacturing methods, not the cutting edge uh, 3D printing, powder bed deposition, direct metal laser sintering methods those methods are those are the th those those methods are the highest end that come for the most specialized applications they're not the equivalent of concrete pouring which is what we actually need uh, i'm sorry what was the second part of the question sorry you anna you're, you're muted thank you sorry which locations in the solar system should we focus on to maximize these efficiencies start with the low hanging fruit. Um, and the low hanging fruit to me means the moon. Um, the moon is not the best place for a long-term human civilization. You know, the lack of an atmosphere and the lack of any long-term uh, terraforming prospects to me kind of tells me that the moon is always going to be, um, you know, a little bit like, you know, Antarctica. You know, people live in Antarctica. We have cities in, Ant in Antarctica, but it's not, um, it's not going to be where a majority of humanity lives. Um, but we're in Antarctica because it's an accessible environment and there's a lot of good uh, resources there. There's a lot of science to be done there. Uh, there's valuable astronomy to be done there. So I would say focus on the low hanging fruit first. In this case, the low hanging fruit being lunar regolith, lunar ice, um, the, uh, the availability of um, Heavy hydrogen, uh, sorry, uh, heavy heavy helium in the uh, in the lunar regolith. All of these are resources that are kind of going to, I think, going to be the first resources of other celestial bodies to be tapped because they are abundantly available. After that, Mars and the asteroids, depending on which asteroids you're talking about. Um, I'm a bit more of a fan of the uh, of the prospects of Mars as an extended second home for humanity because it gives us a little bit more to play with. But there, it's really hard to get to. The, avail the, the accessibility of Martian resources is 
three to 10 times harder, depending on your metric, compared to the accessibility of resources in um, on the moon and in near Earth asteroids. Very cool, thank you. We have another question asking, when do you think is a realistic year we could actually send the first humans to land on Mars? Um, yeah, that's really that, that that's really hard for me to say because it requires uh, it requires forecasting political outcomes. Um, I have no way of doing that from an engineering perspective. If 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 we say none of the rate of engineering changes and none of the rate of uh, of technological progress changes, um, I think it's completely possible that we will have vehicles. Um, that, that, that we will have crewable vehicles, vehicles that could carry crew, um, heading to Mars in the next synodic period, two years from now, with an actual human landing following on after that. Um, whether that it, but that's not um, that's not to say that's a NASA Artemis plan. NASA Artemis doesn't have a uh, Na Na NASA doesn't have a specific timetable for when uh, for when humans sent to Mars. So that would probably be like a SpaceX Starship or something like that. Um, but a lot of the engineering has to go right before uh, before that can happen. Certainly by the 2030s is uh, is what I would say we is when I would say we have humans on the way to Mars. Now, when do we have a permanent habitation on Mars? That's a much harder question to answer. Um, getting humans to and from Mars is comparatively easier than uh, than setting up a permanent facility. You know, in the same way Antarctica was. You know, we had humans exploring Antarctica for 50 years before we had a permanent uh, before we had a permanent settlement in Antarctica. Makes sense. We'd probably be very rich if we could predict um, political outcomes before they happened. Yes, yes. Um, I had a question too about, you know, you had you worked at so many different avenues um, during your spaceflight career. What advice do you have for students who are maybe at the start of their career? Um, what should they be watching out for? What are some insights and lessons learned that you'd like to impart? Yeah, um, breadth before depth would be my recommendation. Um, it is uh, there. Are, th th there are times when it's important to uh, to specialize, to be the leading expert in a subject, and none of those times are when you're a student. Um, that's like if you're if you're pursuing your PhD, that's a time to specialize. But if you're if you're an undergrad, um, I highly recommend um, getting as broad a base of experience as your uh, as your institution allows before you really drill down and become a technical expert in, a, in, in one subject uh, in, in grad school or in industry. Um, there are, uh, there is an abundance of, th 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 there is an abundance of specialists out there, but I would say what we, what we lack are the people who know enough to be dangerous in mechanical engineering, as an electrical engineer, as a, uh, as an astrodynamicist, to the kind, the, the the kind of people who can, um, who know enough to handle experts and bring them together into a cohesive product or a cohesive vehicle uh, that actually flies, that works, that hits its targets. Um, again, that's just my personal experience. I have I have only lived one career, and it is very very diff difficult and dangerous to extrapolate general trends from a data set from a data set of one. But yes, my rec my, my recommendation is while you are a student, you have a unique opportunity to generalize to develop multiple specialties that is much much harder to develop once you become a grad student or once you become uh, an, uh, in industry so use your time as a student to um to attack uh, a breadth of subjects before drilling too deep in and hyper specializing yeah very fair thank you that's very sound advice um folks if you have questions again the chat is open the q a section is open um, in the meantime, I could just ramble. Um, what, what sort of, I know you said not to think of them as Hogwarts houses, um, these different models for our solar system's future, but what do you think you personally ascribe to the most? Um, what do you, what resonates, which approach resonates the most with you? Well, when I, when I was a kid, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the ideas of, of Carl Sagan and space, space for science and astronomy was kind of my very, very first in to, uh, to the concept of space. But then when I was 12, um, I read Robert Zubrin and um, that kind of broadened my perspective to the actual practical constraints, you know, the actual engineering behind it. So I, I would say I wouldn't be where I am on, um, were it not for, uh, for Zubrin 
and uh, and Sagan. Both of their books were incredibly formative um, to to my perspectives and, uh, and 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 what I'm doing now. Um, but on the other hand, you know where I currently work, um, Blue Origin wouldn't exist if it weren't for uh, if it weren't for Gerard O'Neill. Um, the uh, the vision the, vi the 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 vision that we're working towards of millions of humans living and working in space um, is uh, is one that O'Neill would absolutely recognize. Um, but as I've also gotten older, I have also come to understand that none of that, absolutely none of that, happens um, if there isn't a budget for it. Um, and where does the budget come from? Well, it at the moment, it comes from NASA. And where does NASA's budget come from? Well, it comes from Congress. Why is Congress interested in space? I wish it was for, uh, I, I wish it was because Congress critters really care about science. Um, but I think the available evidence suggests it's because Congress is a branch of the federal government and it sees space as an extension of the interests of the federal government. Um, whether that is a good thing or a bad thing is immaterial. It is the way things are. So I I have appreciate I have come to appreciate more and more of um of of von Braun's philosophy as I have gotten older at least as a way to understand why things are the way they are and how things work. Um, I hope we can see a solar system where um things are happening because science is good in and of itself and where people live in space because more people is intrinsically a good thing in and of itself. They don't have to be soldiers. They don't have to be um, they don't have to be colonists. They don't have to be staking a national claim. Um, but it's uh, we're, we're just deluding ourselves if we if we pretend that space is is not an extension of uh, of the things that are happening on Earth. We are you. Can, it, it's impossible to explain why the International Space Station exists without understanding geopolitics. It's impossible to understand why Apollo happened if you don't understand the Cold War. It's impossible to understand why Artemis is the way it is without understanding the uh, the ins and outs of how uh, how funding gets uh, allocated in the federal government. So I have kind of come to understand more and more the real politic of it that is kind of embodied by, the, by, by von Braun. Right, very practical, that makes sense. We have another question um, from Marupa. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. They're asking, were you always interested in space? When did you start yeah. focusing your in space industry? Always. Yeah, I cannot recall a time when I wasn't interested in space. It goes back to a time from before I was forming memories. Very interesting. Um, let's see. Okay. I think those are all of the questions that we have in the chat now. Folks, if you have any more, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to drop them um, in the chat. In the meantime, thank you, Max, so much for coming on our webinar today. Absolutely loved your talk on practical models for our solar system's future. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thank you for having me. Take care. Take care. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for attending. <laughs>